what is good we're coming to the close of the Superflex tight end premium rookie industry mock here we got rounds threes and fours uh for you and jay wayne on the ones and twos the maestro putting this all together um uh, much thanks to him and, and his hard work this was this was wrangling cats a lot of a lot of uh schedules and weeks of work so sorry for our normal viewers maybe not getting quite as much love as they want but hopefully this makes up for it some of the best minds in the industry um and, and a lot of fun really enjoyed it um, yeah make so. sure you hit that like subscribe button okay a lot of hours put into this guy for your pleasure let's get into this third round jb back with us at, at three one this this felt like uh the jb pick the only thing that could have been better for you i feel like is if mims would have fallen this far for you was it my am, am i right in saying this is uh this is you're, you're excited about this here mm -mm. oh all right <laughs> My so you, case you said with my last pick at two hundred one, it's been quite some time since we talked about rookies mm -hmm. and pre NFL draft. I had Jalen Hyatt, I think early second, a two hundred one, two hundred two snap. He didn't get the top forty draft capital. I thought he was going to get. He goes to the New York Giants, where they have fifty of the same receiver. I feel like <laughs> he's slow, but, but Jalen. <laughs> Only ran a four four, you know. No, no, no. I was like, listen, <laughs> listen. It, it, I certainly, I, I don't want to knock him for the landing spot, and that's not really why. You know, three hundred one. I have him in this tier, but the slipping down to the third. And here's the thing for me: I, I'm not falling into the Amon Ross St. Brown trap where you know he slips to the fourth, you know, completely whistling a different tune. But the expectation from everything I was seeing was that this dude was was getting talked about as a top 40 pick. And he slipped and he slipped and he slipped. And he goes into the third round, which is not a death sentence by any means. But, you know, digging into him, looking at the numbers, the 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 route tree is a concern, which it was before. It was before as well. This isn't new information, but... I was maybe blind to the flaws uh, that that Jalen Hyatt's profile presented. I was buying into a little bit, maybe too much uh, uh, hype in the ceiling in certain regards, and the ceiling is still there. But and I hate to say it because it's lazy, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think he's a nice best ball guy, right? <laughs> I and I hate I hate that I hate I think I hate that I just said it, but. Uh, at 301, looking at it right now, I have him in that 210 to 302 tier. So, like, he's fine. I just, I, I hate wide receivers in this range, really. Oh, okay. You know, so looking, like, Tank went 212. Some bastard took Tank right before <laughs> me. Mm. Like I would have gobbled, I would have been thrilled. That's, a, that, that's a, if you if you see if you're in the position you were at 31. And I'm in the position I'm at 212. You're you're calling me. You're calling my front office. We're we're gonna try to figure something out because you want tank. I I am gonna move up for tank. I'm gonna do what I can. Um, I, hopefully you'll be reasonable. I'm gonna need a second round pick. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little tight. Well, can I keep my three, wait, do you want the 301 yeah. and? If you're listening on the podcast. He just bopped around and and bit his <laughs> bottom lip there. Uh, when, when we said about that trade. So you want the three, one and the two. I mean, that would be my first offer. We would probably have to work from there, but I'm going to see how bad you want tank. I, I would move my 24 second for tank. Okay. Uh, he is getting to keep you three, one though. I'll keep that. I'll, I'll keep that. Yeah. I will we'll have to discuss more, but that would, that's fine. It's not a deal, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I put him in the same uh, you know, conversation is what I mentioned previously. The two of them was Zach Charbonnet. Um, and it's sad that I'm sitting here talking more about your pick at 212 than I am my pick at 301. Oh. But I, I, I love Tank at 212. I, he's one of my most rostered, I think third most rostered player. I checked it earlier today. Third most rostered rookie. Another shitty landing spot, seemingly. Top five dynasty back. Uh, but again, if you would have guaranteed me Tank gets third round draft capital, which I, thought he was going to creep up there but uh, not the best landing spot 
at first glance. But anyway, Jalen Hyatt, I just, there are certainly flaws in the profile. I have him at wide receiver eight right now. I was higher pre-draft. How many of those flaws disappear if he's a top 40 pick? <laughs> really should just be one because yeah. it's the, yeah, yeah. but, but probably more than that for me, <laughs> that, that is when, that is when you, you ignore some of the flaws. Yeah. 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 You sweep them under the rug. Those, you those know? warts, you know, they don't look so bad. You know, no, they, all right. they don't look that bad, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not excited about this. No, and, I, and again, if I'm sitting here in this situation and I see, a, you know, we're at 209 and Roshan was still there. Uh, Scott took him. Uh, even Jaden Reed, Tank Bigsby. And I've actually seen Jaden Reed slip to the third a lot mm-hmm. in rookie drafts. A yeah. lot. Too much. Um, but I would have done what I can to move up to get one of those players. Hopefully I have another third round pick. I could package those together. But if I have to dip my dip into my wallet there and get some 24 currency to move up, I, I would do that as well. But yeah, I I, Jalen Hyatt, like it's just. I think, I think I think everybody is. This is, seems about where Hyatt goes. I think everybody feels kind of similarly about him. It could be a, a splash play, and and the the depth chart is kind of open, uh, even though they do have a lot of this, you know redundant receivers. Uh, he he certainly can do something a little different and 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 make some highlight plays. And you know I think it's it's Hyatt or, or Tillman or Tank Dell or Tank Bigsby somewhere around here typically. Uh, so you know, I don't, I don't mind the splash play on Hyatt. Would you, would you be trying to trade down if if it just wasn't working on trading up? I would. Um, and a one target that I, I like, and actually I have him in the tier that he went there at three hundred five. But Chase Brown, another one that, uh, like so many of these guys, right? You could, you could tell yourself that story where, hey, if something happens to Mixon. That mm-hmm. backfield's wide open for Chase Brown. If he yeah, can't do need to be an injury. That could just but, be something. Right. <laughs> you know? a, a off the field stuff creeping yeah. up again. They cut him. Uh, Tank Bigsby. He can have that standalone value with something happening to ETN. Boom, he skyrockets. Same with Charbonnet. Same with Kendra Miller. Uh, you know, and then going back to the wide receivers, you mentioned Jalen Hyatt with the, the potential for the splash play, but the open wide receiver room. It's kind of what I mentioned with Mingo, too. Yeah, there's guys there, but you have Adam Thielen, who's going on 33. You have DJ Shark, who really can't stay healthy. Terrace Marshall, who hasn't done anything. So just so many opportunities, and it's in an improving offense where we saw great strides made by Daniel Jones there last year. So uh, at 301, yeah, Jalen Hyatt, but I certainly don't love it. Yeah. And I, I don't think I need to say that. I think you guys need to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, wh- where can we uh, where can we find JB's uh, down lows? Find me on Twitter at the Bauer Club Dynasty Theory FF. Uh, I'm one of the hosts. You can find us there on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we got the Patreon. We got the Discord. We got all that good stuff for live every Tuesday night on the YouTube channel, and then it kicks on the podcast feed. And we're also part of the DLF Family Podcast. Come check us out. All right, and we'll check you out on four one. Three two spot. We're back with Matt Hicks. What were you thinking here, man? I liked your draft a lot so far, and let's see if we can keep it going. Let's see if I can keep keep the agreements rolling. I like I like it. What's your thoughts here? A little bit of a tilt pick here. You know, Jalen Hyatt <laughs> off the board right before me. That's my guy. I thought I was gonna sneak in with another really great value here. So a little bit of a pivot and. You know, where, where Richardson and Mayer were easy picks for me. This one, there was a little bit more deliberation, but I think Cedric Tillman at 302 is a pretty good value. I've been watching him for a couple of years as a Tennessee fan, so maybe there's a little bit of bias in my love for him. But, you know, a true boundary X type receiver has the ability to really dominate at the catch point. I think he's really sneaky in terms of his speed and ability to gain yards after the catch. Super consistent hands, great body positioning, great catch radius. So he's not somebody who plugs in immediately with a great year one projection. But if you start looking two, three years out, you know, Tillman could be a guy that's getting, you know, 75 plus targets consistently in a Cleveland offense that now we're expecting is going to be a more high volume passing attack that we've necessarily seen the last couple of years. So at 302 here, I think there's a lot of sneaky upside with Cedric Tillman. Yeah, I agree. That that would have been my pick for sure. And I I, I would probably take Tillman over Hyatt, 
sell me sell me a little bit of Hyatt, and then how high would you be willing to take Hyatt? Um, yeah. not, I like the idea of Hyatt in the third round because of of what could be and the splash that could happen, and you know the the average player seeing high highlights and getting excited and and being able to move on, and that that offense is wide open. Uh, but but was a was a little bit down on Hyatt. Now I I would just be flipping those guys, and I would take Hyatt after Tillman, but basically the same order there. Uh, so what's what do you, what did you like about Hyatt? Yeah, I've been a little above consensus the whole way through on Jalen Hyatt. He was my pre-draft wide receiver three. I love Hyatt's ability to separate downfield. Obviously, the speed is there. Um, but what I think he's underrated on, I think he's got really nice handwork. I've seen his route running improve year over year. And, you know, a lot of people are going to knock his route running. He did everything he was asked to do in the Tennessee offense. It wasn't an offense that required a lot of nuance, but – you know, kind of what you're hearing through the draft circles is that, you know, the scouts weren't necessarily worried about his route running ability, weren't necessarily worried about his footwork. And I think he works really well off of press coverage or I'm sorry, off of off coverage. And so he's got a nice release. You can't press him. You know, even the best defensive backs in the SEC couldn't press him. That's why he put up four touchdowns against Alabama. Right. So the upside here, although the draft capital certainly is not what we want to see, he is landing at a wide open Giants offense, right? Yeah. There's not necessarily a wide receiver one. So Jalen Hyatt, I'm not saying he definitely will be the wide receiver one right away, but he could be, you know, he certainly could be. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how that chemistry shakes out. You know, what we heard post draft was that the Giants were very interested in him, you know, ultimately did get a little aggressive to go up and get him. So uh, I'm I'm still really excited about Jalen Hyatt. You know, this seems like kind of where he's going early third round. I'd be mm -hmm. willing to take him in the in the mid to late second round. Uh, that's how bullish I am on his upside. Yeah. So like, would it, would it be over Rasheed Rice? Yep. Yeah, I would take him. You know, kind of looking at the way that this draft fell. You know, I would take Hyatt. You know, over Downs who went at 205, over Rice who went at 208. Um, I like Reed and Mims. Those are two of my guys. Um, and so, you know, Hyatt's kind of in that mix with Reed and Mims for me. It seems like almost every draft I'm, I'm if I'm at the, that top of the three order, I'm, I'm faced with the decision between Hyatt and Tillman and, and all the couple of drafts that I have done. Now, I haven't done as many as all these guys out here and I'm, I'm sure yourself, but it does seem about. Don't y'all know he only ran a four, <laughs> four. Yeah. That was the you funniest. Know? That was the funniest take, man. Yeah. He only he's only ran a four four. I don't know. I don't know. So, so you, slow. So how much, slow. Yeah. How much? Obviously, you're not detracting anything really for the for the scheme that was there, which a lot of people accredit to some of the success from the scheme. Does that not, nothing there worries you a terrible amount? I heard some crazy stat about he had, he was not there was not a single contested target versus man coverage like his entire last yeah, year. That's interesting. I would like to see uh, maybe a little bit more on on how that stat that stat was formulated because, I mean, here it, that's possible. And why I say that's possible is because if you watch Jalen Hyatt play, man, there was never a guy never a lot of guy around him, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think it's important to point out, man, like that that's not the case for every Tennessee wide receiver, right? Like Cedric Tillman was a great contested catch guy, and he he can separate well. Um, but, you know, defensive backs hang around Cedric Tillman. He's not a speedster like Jalen Hyatt is fast, fast, and he knows how to use his body. Yeah. He knows how to get into those angles and find space on the field. He's not just running straight lines like he is working routes. He's working angles. Um, and I say all the time, dude, you can get pretty far in the NFL just running a, a good post route and a really nice slant route. Right. Like yeah. that could get you pretty far in the right NFL offense. So. Um, we know when you're talking about the Tennessee scheme, you have to always take two things into consideration, right? When I'm scouting wide receivers, especially you, ha you try your best to isolate and, and look at their traits outside of the scheme. Uh, and the other thing is you don't knock a player for, for not doing something they weren't asked to do. Right. So I don't necessarily knock Jalen Hyatt for not having the most diverse route tree. He wasn't asked to run the most diverse route yeah. tree. So um, that's when you're going to, you know, try to project coaching, project where he's going to fit in an NFL offense. And I do think to an extent route running can be a little bit overrated when you're thinking about fantasy translation, because even in the NFL, man, not every wide receiver is running the full tree. You know, sure. like I mentioned, there's plenty of guys that get by on two or three routes and Hyatt can be one of those guys. 
Yeah, it would, it would seem like off the rip, like there is, even if he isn't the guy or becomes the number one guy, like there is a role for him on that offense immediately. Whereas Tillman, like you said, may be kind of waiting in the wings or waiting for to, to develop or an injury or, you know, Peoples Jones was pretty good last year. Uh, they brought in Elijah Moore and, and we know Amari is, a, you know, parentally hated on, but a, a very, very good receiver. Yeah. Um, so, but I, you know, I like some of that. I just didn't like the Jalen Hyatt when we were talking about it in the first round. And now, now that we're, you know, anywhere from the mid second on, I, I can definitely be a whole lot more in on Hyatt. I just wasn't ready to be, have him up there with, you know, the Addisons and the flowers and, and kind of those guys. But it seemed like you're, you know, you, you're still pretty high on him. Yeah. And general. at the end of the day, right. Once you get into the third round, your hit rates are dropping. So yeah. you might as well swing for the fences, yeah. right? If you're going to hit, yeah. you might as well hit big. So you know, that's why I lean into guys like Hyatt or, you know, whoever your guys are. If you feel like they have a high ceiling, I, those are the guys that I'm looking at rounds three and round four. So you'd be if you're if you were sitting here at three, two, you saw Hyatt, you know, you see Mims go or whatever. You, you, you're you calling me at, at two twelve and, and the three one guy to see if maybe you can secure Hyatt here. Yeah, man. Always good to work the phones, you know, as long as you're not giving up too much, because I like those late round dart throws, too. So sure. there's some pretty good ones as you get into the fourth round this year. Would you would you trade? I'll say well, you're coming up to two twelve. Would you give me that three two and a, and a second next year for to get Hyatt, or is that too? No, nah, I don't think I can give up that second next year. Well, Listen, if I give I'm you a three back. You're, you're trying Just to get settle me to down, say man. It. Jeez. <laughs> You're you're trying to get me to say it next year's class. It looks good. I know you don't want to be that guy, but uh, I wouldn't be giving up my seconds next year. Not quite yet. Yeah, that well, that's just that would be my first instinct. If you wanted that guy, I would ask for the two, and then I'd try the two three swap. Like, hey, I'll give you you give me the two, I'll give you the three. I'll move back those couple of spots there. How important is it to you? Is really just what I want to see. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I like it. I like I like all your points on on Hyatt, but I I do like the the Tillman take. I, I could see myself splitting fifty fifty through leagues if I have those to make those decisions continuously between the two. Um, for that reason. And, and the third round swing for the fences is always a, a great mentality to have. So, all right, where can we find your stuff? And then we'll get to this last pick. Yeah, man. Rookie big board, YouTube, your favorite podcast provider, patreon.com slash rookie big board, rookie rankings, discord. We're already getting into summer scouting and starting to chop it up about this 2024 class. So, uh, you know, all good stuff. Uh, excited, excited about it. All right. Well, we'll see you on, on four, two. At the 3-3, I took Tank Dell, Nathaniel Dell out of Houston. I'm a really big fan of Tank Dell's game because of his ability to separate, especially when given a two-way go from the slot. Dell is one of those athletes in the low red zone, kind of like Hunter Renfro, that's just nearly unguardable. Uh, I think for C.J. Stroud in that offense, he's going to be a pretty big piece to what they do, especially in, like I said, the low red zone, like Hunter Renfro was two years ago um, with the Raiders. I think that's a big deal when we're talking about Dell's potential upside from the slot. I wouldn't be surprised as early as year two, year three, we're seeing 100 plus targets from the guy because of how consistently he can get open, especially in man coverage. In the low red zone, has a really good feel for zone coverage as well. I like how he can kind of sit in soft spots and and make himself available for his quarterback. Uh, I think he's an underrated player. And if I'm in the early third round of rookie drafts, he's my primary target due to his ability to change the game in the low red zone. That's a big deal for me. Looking at guys with potential 10 plus t- touchdown upside, just like Hunter Renfro, Tank Dell is that guy in the third round for me. All right, back with three, four, a little foreshadowing on the uh, on the last pick with Garrett Price here. So catch him at the Dynasty Nerds podcast or dot com. Any space you want. Hashtag nerd herd. <laughs> who'd you, who, who'd you uh, who are you alluding to as the best as your next best player available here? Well, I, I'm a big believer in super flex drafts that quarterbacks are king. And we had a guy that got day two draft capital and he fell to the third round, and that's Hendon Hooker. Hendon Hooker, I, I honestly believe that if Hooker had not been injured, that he would have been in the first round. Like, I really, truly think that yeah. a team would have taken a shot at him in the 20s or 30s. I think he put up that good of numbers, that good of production against SEC opponents, some of the best defenses we've seen. I get it that he's a little bit older, but I, I truly think at the very least he would have been at or above Will Levis' range. Uh, but but I do think he would have slipped into the first round. Now, the 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 Lions do have an established quarterback in Jared Goff. 
very talented player. He's done everything that they asked him to do. I know he's not this super exciting Anthony Richardson, Patrick Mahomes, like these guys that can dual threat and, you know, bring fans into the stands just of how electric, like that's not golf. He's, he's safe. Uh, But there's a chance that at some point, if, if golf doesn't produce with all of these new weapons that they've added, I mean, they just got Laporta and Gibbs to add into a young dynamic receiving room. So uh, there's a chance that they could end up moving on from Jared Goff. And if so, this ends up being a home run. But even if they don't, he could he could be one of these guys that is there a year or two and a team desperately needs a quarterback. They liked him and they trade for him and, and he ends up doing what Jimmy G did or you know some of these other guys that start off as backups but then become starters because of other teams' needs. So I really like the player a lot. It's a quarterback. And in the third round, there's just a lot of guys that are – you know, backups right now that we're hoping are getting jobs and things like that. So give me the the most valuable position on the board with quarterback. Yeah, I I, I like the pick there. I think I think that's a, a very st- solid pick. I, I I pondered him a little bit at 212 there just for that reason. It's and, you know, Jared Goff is good. The public doesn't love Jared Goff. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're quick to any bad game. They're going to point to hooker. Uh, you know, sure. so I think that helps him kind of stay relevant. Um, and but golf is golf can color between the lines and, and, and take you, you, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. that's, he's like a well-developed child, right? But he's not going to do anything sexy and, or fun. Doesn't know East or West, but, but as they're moving this offense forward and, and hopefully taking the next step, I think he, he can facilitate. It's not, it's not fun or sexy. So anytime that he has a bad game, I feel like hooker kind of is going to continuously get kind of revitalized in the eyes of a dynasty super flex player. So, you know, I, I think I, I, and I liked Hooker and I, you know, I don't I don't care about the age thing either. Um, nah. And one more point to taking a quarterback in super flex is oftentimes to get a quarterback in a trade, you need to give up a quarterback. And yep. this guy is someone that's like, OK, I, I'm trying to move up in quarterbacks. Let me throw you in and Hooker. There's at least the possibility, the name cachet, the, the right. line situation and golf hate that that can like maybe throw that that trade over the top to kind of move up in echelon of quarterbacks. But I I do agree with you that I I, I said it leading up to the draft, whereas I thought that somebody would trade into the back end to get the fifth year with hooker. Um, And it didn't quite happen. And I guess, you know, it is what it is, but I, I, I do agree that if he was not injured, uh, I think he would have had a bit higher capital. So I think he can play. I think he, you know, took him a minute to get rolling. Then Heupel came in at Tennessee and things really got rolling. Unfortunately, you know, Bad injury uh, to wrap up a season. So, on, you know, pretty unfortunate for him. Uh, real, but, real quick, I did want to mention, yeah. uh, we're in the third round now. Mm-hmm. I loved your guys' pick in the third round. Uh, Luke Shoemaker. Yeah, I think he's how did like, that happen? Like one of the most underrated picks. I've been taking him at the end of the third in like every draft. A guy that, that got the second round draft capital, but he's not getting any of the respect of all the other guys mm-hmm. that got second round draft capital, even though it might be the best landing spot for right. a tight end out of all of them. The, I don't the get easiest it, so. path to to targets like immediately. Yeah. I had planned on taking him with my next pick when I saw you guys took him there and I was like, ah, no, <laughs> dang it. Yeah, no, I I pr- pretty athletic. You know, and I didn't know a ton about him, but once it happened, I had to go back and and familiarize yeah. myself. And and you know that Dak loves that safety valve tight end. And now we're not sure exactly what's going to play out with that offense there, uh, with with Kellen out and and McCarthy in. Uh, but I think Dak still likes what Dak likes. So put a nice athletic tight end. All he's got to do is beat out Ferguson and uh, who's the Hender Hendershot. Yeah, I mean, Hendershot. I, th- I think he can do that. Um, exactly. So yeah, I. I I did like that at the at the tight end premium spot. Was there any other consideration here that that is usually your other third round go to? Yeah, there there were a couple guys that I I did think were interesting here uh, at this point, but it it was Hooker really stood out above the rest. Had Tillman or Dell fallen a spot, that would have been tough for me. Uh, both of those guys I would have really considered uh, there at that spot. Uh, another guy that is kind of interesting is uh, Kayshawn Boutte, but mm. I, I don't like taking him in the third because I just feel like there's other there's other options that I think have similar ceiling but with less risk. So yeah. 
Yeah, it, I think Hooker was the one that that really stood out to me as probably the best value in the third round. All right. Well, and last question on the third round here. What what is your stance on the third and fourth round? Because it's, you know, coming through here and listening to everybody kind of talk about how some people are like, hey, in this particular third round, I'll take, you know, a three and a four to get out. Are you are you more getting in, more getting out, just kind of staying put? What's your general stance on this year's third, fourth round? Yeah, once I, once I get to about the second half of the second round, I I'm willing to move in or out depending on if there's a player I really like. Uh, but if I can package it together for some draft capital in the future, I'm cool with that too. But really for me, it's all about ceiling. Like what is the, the highest possible outcome for this player? Because that's all I care about. If they, if they do nothing second end of second round picks on through do nothing all the time. Like that's very normal. That's almost expected for them not to do something. Uh, but if I see a guy that at least has a shot, there's a path, there's the talent, there's something there that'll intrigue me. Cause a lot of times I like to have at least two of these three things for a guy that's like a sleeper for me. One, I have to love their tape Two, They crush the combine and three, they, they have a clear path to playing time touches, whatever. If two of those three things are true, I'm probably going to be in on them in the third round, fourth round, things like that. Yeah. I like that. That's a good, uh, good answer. Good answer, Mr. Price. Um, Thank Thank you. All right. We'll see you in the fourth round. Sounds good. All right. We're back at three, five with Corey. How are you feeling here, man? What are we thinking at three, five? Yeah, I mean, that big cluster of wide receivers was, is, is definitely an early third round kind of target for me with, you know, Tillman and Hyatt and all those dudes that went on day two of the NFL draft. But I am ecstatic to get Chase Brown here. Chase Brown was a guy that I had in my running back rankings pre-draft. I had, you know, the obvious guys, Bijan, Gibbs, mm-hmm. Charbonnet, um, and then uh, Tank Bigsby was actually my RB4, Roshan Johnson, my RB5. I had Chase Brown right in that range with those guys. So I thought this was you know, a complete back before the draft. And usually I gravitate towards guys that have full three down skill sets because that's led me to being higher on than the market on Tyler Algier last year than Damian Pierce last year, than Ramondre Stevenson a couple years ago. I think guys that are well-rounded get in the good graces of coaching staffs and they are able to earn volume. And Elijah Mitchell was also somebody that was really high on a couple of years ago. And he was actually my comparison for Chase Brown. And they tested very similarly, both like 200 and, nine 210 pounds five foot ten can kind of do everything well but not really anything exceptional is is kind of what i saw on film uh, at illinois with chase brown and he was productive he's got good size he's a good athlete he can catch the ball but he's not going to like you know be jameer gibbs out of the backfield kind of thing so for me landing in the cincinnati Bengals backfield where joe mixon's on the outs maybe cut maybe traded whatever we don't exactly know it's a it's a position where i got a well-rounded three down back who i liked pre-draft going to one of the best offenses in the NFL that potentially has a guy who who's you know not going to be there long term. Even if it's mid-season and you get half a year of RB2 production out of Chase Brown, he might skyrocket in value and that third that 3-5 that I just spent on him, I might be able to shop him for a late first rounder like we were doing for Michael Carter and Elijah Mitchell a couple of years ago. Yeah, so this is this is one of my my favorites as well, uh, especially in that we get into the third round. I had Chase Brown ranked around the same area, a couple different guys in there, but uh, around around the same area. I, I like once we get into this third round, I like Brown and I like Evans and Tillman and Tank Dell, and those are kind of my shots in this third round. Are you actively trading in to the beginning, middle of the third round, if any of the guys like you might have your guys in the third round or do you, is that a way you typically play or is that something that you shy away from? Yeah. I mean, in this class, there's no real consensus. So I find mm-hmm. myself in the the late second, early third, mid third round, always kind of liking somebody on the board, not being like, ah, the board stinks. Cause like, I feel like everybody has their guy because there was no, you know, real defined, like the first like nine picks or so, I think is pretty chalky. Everybody kind of, yeah goes the same way. But once you get outside the top 15, you know, people are going off the board. Like someone took Spears at two, four. I have him ranked in the third round. Like you could kind of go any which way and chase Brown, you know, like you said, I love Cedric Tillman as well. He's another one of my, you know, mid third round price tag guys, Zach Evans, like you said, also pretty solid. I like Tucker craft a lot in the like late third round area. There's everybody's got their guys in this class. So for me, I, I didn't really feel a need 
because all my rookie drafts are now done to move around in the third round. I kind of just had a guy fall to me usually when I needed to. Yeah, I've been I've been finding myself trying to get back up into that three, three to three, six range to just grab an extra one of those guys. And I mostly because I don't think a lot of people like this class and they're willing to kind of come off of those guys uh, a little cheaper than uh, maybe maybe in the past years. But once we get to that back of that third round, for me, it starts to especially if I'm in the back of that third round, I try to try to get up there and grab, you know, the Chase Brown, which I, you know, I, I he's clearly not Jameer Gibbs in the receiving, but I thought the receiving game was was pretty strong from the hands are really good and and the routes are decent. I mean, it's not crazy, but and again, uh, you know, can be a workhorse isn't necessarily going to blow you over with power, but man, uh, a, a lot of good. And, you know, like you said, a fellow a fellow Canadian there. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love work, played uh, football in London, Ontario, about 45 an hour away from where I am right now. And yeah, I mean, he, he does the little things well. And I think coaches will like that. He has like great vision, good pass protector. Like he does the dirty work. And mm -hmm. that's why, why he kind of reminded me of Elijah Mitchell and probably why Elijah Mitchell beat Trey Sermon out his rookie season is because he did those little things and Sermon didn't. And the community was very split on those two. Actually not split at all. They all yeah. thought it was going to be Sermon. As Sermon guy. And I, I didn't draft any sermon and I drafted Name. Elijah Mitchell all of the Elijah Mitchell in the third, fourth, fourth round. round. <laughs> yes. Yes. A hundred percent thoughts on uh Hendon hooker. Like if he hangs around, is that somebody that you'd be interested in or not really? I don't I, like it. I, I, don't like it. <laughs> I saw a backup quarterback when I watched him, uh, when I watched five games of his tape and I saw Teddy Bridgewater, Jacoby Brissett, high level backup good bridge quarterback guy that can that can probably stick around in the league i just don't think that you know like as, as you know mediocre as jared goff can be at sometimes i don't think the detroit lions will be happy to be going into a season with hen and hooker either i i don't think they'll they'll t turn the keys over to hen and hooker and be like all right we're set for the next 15 years i think best case scenario we're looking at like a desmond ritter type of situation or like maybe a sam howell situation but even howell i thought was a much better prospect than than uh hen and hooker i think desmond ritter is kind of like the comp for me is like the best case scenario is this guy gets like maybe a short leash starting job for like half a season or a full season and then the last question in this uh area here is if let's say you have Brees uh or jt does does a banacanda and and holby or a saquon and gray do, do they become a little bit more of a priority at all or is it do you not care about that so my philosophy when it comes to handcuffs is I like to grab other people's, not my own. Ah, so yeah. that's the I, zero I'm, zero RB. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I build. So most of my running back cores in dynasty are going to have like a Bijan or like a Brees or Jonathan Taylor, some like great running back on my team. And I'm going to draft like 15 Chase Brown, Zach Evans types uh, to fill out the rest of my roster. And I, I can piece together RB2 production most of the year. And, you know, if a Banacanda were to fall to me in like the four two or something like that, then yeah. And I had a Brees Hall as my starting running back. But I I don't know. For for me, I don't really force, you know, handcuff type of situations. I just grab running back depth. And I, I find the third and fourth round is typically the best time to grab running backs because, you know, it's the most injury prone position in like sports probably. Sure. And, uh, you, you know, you're going to get like probably all these guys that go in the third, fourth round, you're going to get three or four weeks next year. Their rookie seasons of them being like RB twos. Yeah, I, I, the, and some pretty talented handcuffs here who just ended up being pushed down and and, and ending up in that situation. So um, I, I think that's a that's a fun strategy there. I I I wouldn't say I do that all the time, but I I, I don't disagree. So all right, man. Well, we'll catch you on the last pick here. Sounds good. We got Ray Garvin at the three six, aka Ray G, aka Ray GQ. <laughs> He's got a lot of surnames and and uh, it goes by a lot of things. Destination uh, Debbie, check him out. Destination Debbie, check him yes. out. Um, all right, man. So we've been we've been chatting. We've been asking about these tight ends. You're on the clock here. I can see the box. It's yellow. Uh, what were you thinking here? I'm I'm feeling good right here. Okay. I mean, I'm at the three six spot. And this is around the time that I'm comfortable in a 1.5 tight end premium taking a shot on a tight end. We all know that of anything that we're not good at in fantasy football, which is a lot, but it's figuring out what tight ends are good and bad. Like we have yeah. no idea. Like you just don't go find me outside of uh, Kyle Pitts or Brock Bowers. We have no clue. So um, at this point when, you know, you're in the middle of the third round, Luke Musgrave was picked 42 in the drafts. I mean, he went a few picks after Sam LaPorta. They're both hot top 45 NFL draft capital picks. 
they both land on offenses that have a lot of opportunity. I was able to accrue, like I, I got to wait into the three six and and still got an athletic tight end with high draft capital. I feel great. Like is Luke Musgrave going to be good? Do I have any strong <laughs> conviction on Luke Musgrave? Like I'm, I'm being dead ass serious with you. I, I don't know and don't really care. He has the capital. He has the athletic profile and he's probably going to have the op- some opportunity. And at the three, six spot, I'm taking him over a sixth round receiver. What am I going to do with that? Like, you know what I mean? I'm looking yeah. at, I'm looking at Boutte. Like w- what am I going to do with that? Right. You're never going to put Keishawn Boutte in your lineup. You know, I think Tank Dell is cool. Like, I hope, but he's 5'8", 160. I've learned my lesson, right? So at this spot, as I'm looking around, and Hend- Hendon Hooker, when's he getting on the field? Absent the Jared Goff injury. That's just a zero on your roster. You know, so I'm looking around, and this is the point where I'm like, now I can pull the trigger on a tight end. And you look at the tight end that you got. It wasn't like a fifth rounder. It wasn't like it was a seventh round Hail Mary, it's the 42nd, 43rd pick of the NFL draft. Who's an athletic freak? Sign me up. What about what about our boy uh, uh, Schoonmaker back there? What do you think from being Love a Cowboys him. fan? Would he be on the Love radar him. for you at all if Love Musgraves him. wasn't there? Love him. Love him. Give me – he would have been – if Musgrave was gone and it was between Schoon, Washington, Kraft, Strange, Schoon would have been next. Uh, I kind of am, am – I think Schoonmaker is going to be a lot better and a lot more involved than people think. So – um, and that's a piece of an offense that I want. And Dak loves the tight end. So right. I like it. Any thoughts of any thoughts of taking him over Musgrave just because of maybe that, yes. that Kraft is a little more ready than than Musgrave yes. is maybe off the jump? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have no problem. If you want to put Schoonmaker over Musgrave, that's fine by me. And I I I don't know if I have him ranked like that. I think I do actually. I think I have Schoonmaker over Musgrave. So yeah. Portfolio yeah. though, baby. You gotta get a little bit of both. Yeah. Well, some other wise guy, just like you were you know, really loving that tank pick. Some other wise guy took took, took old Schoon back there. So, yeah, um, <laughs> I like how about, it. How about so let's let's rewind a little bit. You're sitting there at three six. You see me on the clock at two twelve. Tank's still available. Are you are you trying to do everything you can to get up to that two twelve? Saying hey, maybe this is my cut off of something that I really like, or are you just you chilling out because you know you're not not, well, not. Realistically, what would you want from me? What would you want? My three, six, and what? I mean, I'm going to ask for a two. No, absolutely not. I'm not All giving right. you a two and a three for the 212. No. Well, what, what if we did a two, three swap and that three, six? What if I gave you a two, you give me a, th- or I give you a three, you give me a two, I take the three, we, six? I'd do that. Okay. Got to get that. that. Got to get that swap in there, kids. Yeah. You know, ask for the two. <laughs> ask for the two. I'd they say that. no. That's All fair. right, I'll give you a three back. That's for me, that's fair. Like I'm not even I, and see, I'm the type of trade partner where when it's fair, I'm not even going to try to squeeze you. You know what? That's fair. I get the bump here. You get the bump there. You move back now. I move back. Yeah, I'm not it. like good. Fair deal. I do that. Yeah. All right. No, no interest in Zach Evans. Or if you like, if you have a handcuff at this point, let's say you have no. Brees, there's no it, it, a band of no. is not in the not in the question. No. You don't care about the handcuffed. <laughs> What are we having? Sex? <laughs> is it, dude, it is it is he is RB4 on that team. I like a band of Canada. Handcuffed? No. If if Brees Hall goes down, Izzy Abanacanda is not being thrown in there so if you to have, handle the work. So no, if you have sir. acres, is Evans making a push Absolutely. into that three? I'll, I'll, I'll put money that Kyron Williams touches the ball more than Zach Evans does. No, man. And all right. All where right. did you know, it, it's just, the face? Where, where did I think it's the I think it's the like we're just we're over. These are rookie running backs, man. You know what I mean? Like they're rookie run, fifth, sixth, seventh round picks. These th- these dudes, the, the, the likelihood that these cats come in and just be a Damian Pierce and ascend up the chart day one, slim to none. It's just no, none yeah, of those I, dudes. I, I feel you don't shoot the messenger here, but, um, you know, is so there's no situation where you're touching any running back in the third round here. Yeah. Yeah. I said the, the, dif- the delineation between lineup and, and, and best ball. So yeah, I, you know, at, in this spot right now. <laughs> so you want to take the second round tight end in the NFL draft. And then when, if those guys were gone, if Musgrave yeah, was gone like, and Schoonover it, was gone. It, yeah. Well, th- and that's my thing, right? We lean so much on capital 
literally like the, whatever you think, whatever we think is a prospect, like it, they spent the 42nd pick on him. Like he was a high second round pick and we're talking tight and premium. Like this is what I want to, I want to invest there. Like if I'm going to spend my capital, give me the Kendra's in the second round, give me Roshan, give me tank Bigsby. Let me get one of those guys that I actually think is kind of good. And then when I get down to the third and fourth round, even if that tight end isn't good, I know they have the capital that they're going to get an opportunity. And if it works out great. And if not, I can move on and you just, you get, hell you could get, look what you get in the fourth round. Yeah. So is there, is there any, ever any point where you like kind of, I understand what you're saying. Like you're not really trying to bet on an outlier, but is there any point where through the process you fall in love with a guy who ends up kind of being an outlier and in the third and the fourth round, you want to take the shot or are you just saying, Hey, I'm just not fucking doing that. Man, it's it's fantasy football and you got to have fun. And there right. are some times where you just listen. Uh, Deuce Vaughn is is one of the like, it's just an outlier you shouldn't bet on. Like, I'm just going to say it like that. And I've got I drafted Deuce Vaughn. I, I want some Deuce Vaughn. Like, I just want to bet on him being creative and being good. So absolutely. I think there are there are times where, you know, you just bet on your guy in the fourth round. Like look, like, look at the names in the fourth. Like, you you give me one strong reason why, you know, 4-1 over 4-4 four, four, or 4-9 four, behind 4-5. Like, you know, I, I think this is where you could just have some conviction and go get your damn guy in the hell with process. Do that in the fourth round. Go get your guy. Yeah. Go get so, your guy. What, I, would you just ra- assu- just assume if you could just move off the third and fourth for the most part and either kick them down the line or just try to, you know – double them up and 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 move up or are you just trying to just kind of avoid these rounds for the most like part how many third yes. and fourth round picks do you make you know i don't want them this year man and there's and there's data that just shows like from a war perspective like the likelihood that they're roster cloggers is much higher than the likelihood that they're superstars like just historically they're third and fourth round picks and for everyone that can say oh terry mclaurin or i found this guy in the third of a rookie draft Go look at them just historically. They're just awful. So if I could, let me just say hypothetically in this situation, if I could have moved three, six, and four, six for next year, a second rounder in 24, I'd do that in a heartbeat. You yeah. know what I mean? Even if I'm giving up the leverage of a pick, I don't even like the the value of that fourth. If I can give you those two and I can get a second rounder next year, I'd kick I'd kick it down the line and get a second. Sure. But so but you would would you rather take get out of the third, take a three and a four for next year and just kind of use them in season at, at, rather than and for in, in trades rather than make make the picks? I don't know. I don't know about that one. Because right. um, there's a lot of other little things that go on in here, right? In the game, inside the game. You know, mm-hmm. in, in a 1-5 tight end premium, if Musgrave is good, right? Now we're just using him because he was my pick. Sure. Like I know I can get more than a three, four from Musgrave, right? Like I just know it. Like he's a young athletic tight end and they've spent capital on him. I just know that I would rather bet on that portion of ROI opposed to the, to the, you know, you know, the one that's right in front of me. Right. Yeah. I'll take the two in the bush. <laughs> gotcha. Let me get gotcha. two in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, let's get out of here. What, what, uh, where can we find you at? Yeah, on Twitter at Ray G Q Q U E, YouTube Destination Devi. All right, we'll see you at four six on the last one. Yes, sir. All right, we're back at the three oh seven. There was a little doubt in in who you took on when we saw you last time. Yeah. Um, Talking with got, the Zoltan. Yeah, we got don't we got uh, the Zoltan at Dynasty Zoltan Zoltan FF. Is that correct? It is correct, and it is Zoltan. Yeah. Sorry. Like no Zoltan worries, no Ibrahimovic. Worries. Um, where can we find all your stuff real quick before we get into your disappointing pick? <laughs> yeah. Uh, check me out at, uh, at dynasty Zoltan FF on Twitter, dynasty Zoltan podcast, Patreon account, uh, et cetera. All right. So who were you, who were you bummed about and who would have been the prospect that was still there to make you excited? And, and why were you so bummed about this pick? So uh, I took Kayshawn Boot- Boutte or Booty. I don't know. I've heard it both ways. And uh, my problem with this pick is that there are just so many red flags. I mean, mm-hmm. he had 30% of his production in three games of his college career. He had, I think, a seventh percentile um, jumping score and agility score. Like, he just wasn't 
I think he 29 inch ver, uh, vertical. He just wasn't interested in doing the things that to me shows he has a good work ethic. LSU basically told him not to come back. There are so many red flags, but the reason that I did take him is the early production in the SEC. It's hard to argue against, and there were times on tape, especially in his first two seasons, that he really flashed. I mean, there were conversations, him or Jackson spent the jig, but before the season, and those weren't insane conversations. Boutte had, like, an incredible first two seasons. Then he had a double ankle surgery. If you want to write off all of the junior year, if you want to write off the, you know, maybe attitude issues or just, you know, work ethic issues to some frustrations with the LSU scheme, which was definitely there – it's just a tough pick because there are a lot of reasons to like him, a lot of reasons to hate him. Sex sure. parties, though, plus. <laughs> you know, if I was drafting my friends in this draft, he he would have been in conversation in the early second. I, he said it seems like a great time. Yeah, him and him and Bobby Kraft might have some stuff to talk about. I don't hey. know. <laughs> um, so no, no, Zach Evans, who was still on the board there. I don't remember if you were in or out on Zach Evans beforehand. Yeah, um, it's tough. I I actually think I would have taken. I should have taken Zach Evans. Um, if I'm looking back at this board now, that's the regret I do have. I, my board behind me, I have Zach Evans uh, a slot higher than Butte, and I I think the reason why I would prefer that is because they're both basically dart throws. But the upside of his of if Zach Evans hits because he has all this pedigree coming in with Butte does too. But if Cam Akers gets hurt or for some reason uh, uh, they lose trust in him, like you could see a reasonable path for Zach Evans. You could flip him for like two second rounders in October. And there's just no way that Boutte is going to have like the 300 yards in the first three weeks that it would take for him to get to that value. Yeah, I I think that's a that's that's a fair, fair point there. I just like Evans more than Boutte, but I think that's a good point there. What what would be the. What would be the uh, if you could trade? What would be the strategy here? You sitting tight? You trying to move up? Is there people in front of this? Is there a spot that you want to try to get to, or is it just kind of sit tight and whoever you get, you get here? Well, given my first two picks, the fact that I would have traded up to get Luke Musgrave is pretty on brand. Um, <laughs> but no, in, in fact, it would be Hendon Hooker. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I'm looking for guys who could potentially have a quick value flip. I think mm-hmm. Hendon Hooker's value is very safe until at least you know next February. Um because there's going to be questions about Jared Goff through essentially the whole season. <laughs> every and game. Every exactly, back game. Every exactly. back game. <laughs> and, and the Lions have expectations this year. And sure. so if you look at that and, you know, Jared Goff, either if he gets injured or if he has a run of bad games, there's going to be a lot of Hendon Hooker hype. I, I kind of compare it to Desmond Ritter situation where he could easily, I, I think Goff is better than Mariota. But you could see uh, Hooker easily being worth, you know, an early second, late first next year, even if he doesn't play or like Ritter doesn't play well. Yeah. And I think, you know, to the point of golf being better than Mariota, I think Hooker's better than Ritter. So, you know. yeah. Um, so Hooker would be your your target or was was Musgraves really been your target? Uh, I, I, I do wish Musgrave was there. If he was there, I would have taken him. But Hooker is the guy that if he falls to the third round of the draft, I am jumping on it. If if I have a if I have the 307 like I did here, I'm trading a 307 and a future third to get Hooker. I mean, I, I just see I see almost no way that his value is below that and there are paths for it to be way above that. So I'm, I'm going to invest in hooker and, and just hope to strike gold. Yeah. I think that's, it's two good, uh, two good calls there and on the three. And I, I like, I still don't mind taking Boutte in the third, but hooker and Evans would both have to be gone for me. I'm not sure about Musgraves. I, I like him, um, but he's not a guy that I'm, targeting hardcore like i would be for those other three tight ends that are ahead of them no i Um, i I agree with that yeah it's it's really it's really evans and hooker that i'm targeting in the in the early third round yeah what are your uh thoughts on like like a tank dell or like hyatt would that be somebody falling into the third that you would he seems like a quick flip kind of guy like that's kind of wide open there's not a whole you know wandell's hurt we don't really know what that core is going to be daniel jones Presumably taking another step forward in an offense that we all kind of like that we get excited for. Um, yeah, I I think there's certainly that quick flip potential. I I just don't believe in the talent at all. So yeah. like in, I in Hyatt. I, yeah, in, in Hyatt. So I'm gonna bet on Butte over Hyatt. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I would take him over it because that's not what the value would tell you to do. But I sure. would trade back and do that. Um, gotcha. 
so I, I'm just not that that interested in Hyatt. Tank Dell, I'm I am slightly interested in, but the thing is, I've been getting him at the three eleven or three twelve in a lot of leagues, yeah. and and the reason why is because Sleeper lists lists him. I think they had him listed under Nathaniel Dell and his ADP was higher. And now he's listed under Tank Dell and his ADP is below like A.T. Perry and Michael Wilson. So he I hasn't think it's caught up. Yeah, I think it's totally a sleeper ADP issue because I've been getting him at like the 404 when it's just like there's no reason this guy should be on the board. Hey, but that's part of knowing knowing what platform you're drafting on, yeah. knowing what list they're giving everybody else because – when you don't necessarily know who to pick, like who's at the top, this is what they think I should do, you know? So like that, you uh, definitely uh, especially know for, especially people, for people who spend less time on, you know, the, the sure. later prospects than, than we do. Like a lot of them are just going to, you know, read the little blurb for whoever's up. Maybe they're in one or two drafts yep. and they just, is it the last blurb like. good or bad? You know, that's what's <laughs> exactly. good. All right. So we got Butte and we're unsure about it. Uh, but, Let's uh let's get out of here and we'll we'll see you at four seven. Maybe you can be a little more excited about that one. Oh, I will be. <laughs> so we're back with Jeff Bell. We're at the three eight now. For whom J Bell tolls. Now we might be out of your window here. So tell us what you were thinking on the three eight pick and who is it? Yes, yeah, so we we are definitely out of the window, but a player that I love to grab in the third round that I've tried to grab later in the third every chance that I could is Zach Evans for the yeah. uh, playing with the Los Angeles Rams. And really, when you look at Zach Evans, he was a five star recruit coming out of high school, had some questions about his recruitment, had a little bit of injuries that delayed his college takeoff. But for landing in the sixth round, he landed in, in about his best opportunity that he could. He has a chance to emerge as the direct backup to Cam Akers and it might might take an injury to really get him into a role. But again, we're kind of dealing with late third round picks. And so if you can give me a running back in the late third round that has a potential to be a direct handcuff, I, I am all over that all day long. I, I don't love to take wide receivers this late. And I think that right now, all the quarterbacks that you would feel good in Superflex are off the board. And and even some of the tight ends that you really feel good about just went right before me. A guy like Luke, Luke Musgrave went the 306. I would have loved mm-hmm. to grab him. That's a guy that I talked earlier about, like that 304 drop off. I would have had him within that group. And so all those guys being off the board, I want to grab a running back here because we've seen time and time again that late these third round running backs two years ago, Elijah Mitchell stepping into a role. Sure. We've seen these players in the past that um, you, you just kind of throw a dart there. And if the backfield breaks their direction, then you've got immediate production. Whereas wide receiver, it's it's such a path with wide receiver to really get into your fantasy lineup compared to just getting on the field. Whereas a running back, if a guy's a starting running back, he's going to get the ball and he's going to score you fantasy points and you know to put him in your lineup. And so that's why I love to grab Zach Evans later in the third round. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that's a you know one of my circled third round guys for sure. Uh, try to try to kind of acquire it at any cost, but if the cost is right, and I think you know the general public is down on on kind of that third round guy so it seems to be cheap to move around is that is that something that you're interested in you, you kind of talked about three four three five if you are back you kind of hinted alluded to it a little earlier if you are back here at three eight or three nine are you trying to, to move up and and get yourself one of your more uh favorite guys in that three one to three four range or are you just hanging out no, I am. I, 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 I try very, very hard. If I'm have a late third to try to bump up into that 304. And if you're somebody that you haven't done your rookie drafts yet, if your league isn't very actively plugged in, I would be trying hard to um, I'm willing to give up like I, things that I try to offer are multiple fourth round picks to move that 308 up into the, the top of the third round um, because I think that there you can grab players after the draft that really are pretty similar to the fourth round, yeah. especially later fourth, or uh, if there's like a vet, if you got like a Rehe Mostert or something like that kind of hanging out on your roster and you can find that person that thinks that that vet is going to plug in for them. And I don't know, I, I'm okay moving veteran production, especially as you get closer to 30 in that range. Uh, I don't know. I kind of discount that pretty heavily, but I think that dynasty mind as a whole does that, especially this time of year especially in your rookie drafts people aren't too concerned about having that open hole at running back right now whereas in the season you can do a little bit more of that i think that's part of the reason why it's important um so like with the debbie royale a lot of what we do the debbie work and a lot of what we do is try to 
target those tiers very, very early before they are feeling very established. And uh, so you can operate because it's going to be a lot cheaper in January to move up to the 106 from the 109 than it is right now when you know yeah. you're kind of at that point. And so I think one of the things we do well and one of the things we try to target and do is to identify those tiers so that you're able to move up when you're just giving up a little bit as compared to people not wanting to break those tiers and feeling very, very firm um, with the understanding once you get into that rookie room. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go about it. So make sure you go check out the Debbie Royale on YouTube and you can find Jeff Bell. Uh, where, where's where's all the rest of your stuff at, Jeff? You can find me with Football Guys and then you can find me on Twitter at For Whom J Bell Tolls. Perfect. And if you're not following him, it's a it's a fun follow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he knows how to he knows how to stir it up. He, he I like but in a nice in a nice way. Nothing malicious. I, I enjoy yeah. it and always enjoy the make uh, you double take <laughs> sometimes. But yeah, nah, that, that's kind of what I'm going for. No, I ne- never attack anybody. Just kind of make you think a little bit and, and people react funny ways to that. But um, I have fun with it. So, yeah. Yeah. You catch somebody having a bad day and they're going to fucking tell you about it. Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I hear it. Almost yeah. Every day on <laughs> yeah. All right, man. We'll get you in round four. Cool. All right. Back here at the three nine with Scott Connor. What you got? AKA bud? Charles Chill. <laughs> The Charles AKA the Warp Warrior. The Warp Warrior, yes, yes. <laughs> Sticking with the Warp, so I just put out an episode on Destination Devi talking about Warp and draft picks in this range. Go back and listen to it. Uh, it's the episode that was just released on May the 15th. Uh, this is definitely a negative Warp pick, so where if you're picking <laughs> a player here, if they make your roster, if they ever give you a usable week or two or three or whatever is – definitely a win uh anything i said at the 209 is going to apply to this pick as well i took israel banacanda at 309 people hated his landing spot i remember watching the draft he fell to round five you're sitting there going oh does this team need a running back does this team need a running back and then the jets take him and people are like oh man that's he's buried that's the worst spot uh you guys remember when zeke got cut and he said I want to play for the Bengals, the Eagles, or the Jets. And of course, all three of those teams within like a day came out and said, I'm not, no, we're not we're interested yeah. in him. But I remember Brees Hall tagging Michael Carter on Twitter. Like, bro, we don't need this guy. You know, like essentially we're good. You know, right. we don't need Zeke to come in because Zeke comes in. He's just taking touches from those two for sure. So then they draft a band of Kanda. Zonovan Knight's still there. He's good enough to be like a third running back on a team. Sure. Bam, bam. So they have exactly they have a weird competition here, probably for the backup. And I a couple smart people out there have said, you know, like they probably drafted a Banacanda for a reason. And it's not to sit behind Zonovan Knight and Michael Carter. Like he he's gonna get a legitimate shot, maybe even in the preseason to start because of Brees' injury. So I think he's probably sneaky and it's just one of those. Um, it's a negative warp pick. If I threw this pick away, it's not a big deal, but I think there's a lot of upside in this pick. Yeah. There's some contingent value. I mean, Zach Evans going in front of him. I'd rather have a band of Canada. Oh, see, I'm taking Evans, but why, why is that? Fair. Why do you, why do you think that? Uh, I think he's better. Ooh, uh, I think he okay. can do more. But I guess you could also argue you like Zach Evans' situation a little better just in terms of being able to get opportunity Path, right yeah. away. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Do I, I mean, you, you, a band of Canada could come out and, and earn a spot if, if Brees is slow played in. There, there's certainly the highlight real potential with a band of Canada. We know what that breakaway speed can look like, and we know he can hit home runs. So he, I think he could come out and solidify himself as the second, you know, as the Michael Carter in this offense. But I think Evans hasn't. Potential. I mean, Akers was good to end the season last year, um, but Evans has the potential to come out and 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 grab a hold of a, a pretty substantial role, possibly. You know. Well, and to your point, the one reason I think you could justify Evans is there's a lot of people that like him. Right. It's the opposite of the Will Levis argument, right? Sure. Like, there's a ton of people that like him. If he were to come out and let's just say he's the starter by week three. That's an that's an automatic sell candidate where you could definitely get a second from people, even though you took him at here. He went at the 308. Like that's a guy you put him on the block and there's numerous people. Oh, I believe, you know what I mean? I'll give you a second. I'll give you a second and a third. 
Um, I think it's the same with Chase Brown. If there's a point where he's starting, people will go, okay, Bengals starter, even if it's for one year, I'll buy. Sure. So I could justify those two because I don't think you get that with a Bandicanda as long as like Bam Knight and Michael Carter are on the team and Brees Hall is playing. I don't think people are going to be like, I have to go buy a Bandicanda, whereas Evans and Chase Brown could have runways where people say, I, I need them. You know, and then I, yeah, yeah. The, the best deal is you can sell a guy like Evans for, let's say you can get a second, but the key is you get another running back thrown in the deal. Another sure. backup that is, you know, two games away from his yeah. injury break. You get your own Ford or, you know, somebody, whoever it is right. at the time. Yes. Yes. Right. So, all right. So what, what's your typical third and fourth round approach? Is it, is it trade out, trade in, is it dra- depend on the draft? Do you hold them? Do you you fault? You push them down the line? Like, would you be fine with trading out at three nine right here if somebody gave you uh, a three, two threes, basically, a, you know, two threes next year? Yeah, I, I think to the point at the two oh nine with Roshan, you know, making too many picks. I think if you can get two threes, achieves basically the same thing I'm trying to accomplish, but I don't have to make a pick. I don't have to pick between you know however many options are on the board. Um, I do think it depends on your league. I'm in some leagues where people don't care about thirds during the season. It's kind of dead. It's kind of inactive. Yeah. Maybe not. That's that's not the league I want to hold those two thirds. If it's a real active league where every you know every weekend, every Saturday night, Sunday morning, someone's trying to trade a backup quarterback, a backup running back, they'll take a third just to kind of liquidate and move that piece because yeah, it's yeah. the only time they can do it. Those leagues I like to have the picks. So I think if I know my league. I'm totally okay getting out of these picks. Uh, and it's usually dependent on how many running backs are left. I mean, after him, there's still about five or six I would draft. But if those guys are gone, you're starting to dip into UDFAs, mm-hmm. late seventh round picks, like to the point where I'll pick them up off waivers if no one takes them. But I really would rather kick my picks to the future. Gotcha. But what would be the uh, the the one selection if they weren't, gone would it be evans or or chase brown would be if they were still around that would make you change your pick from a band of candy here or is it tank dell or obviously tillman and hyatt are, are not going to make it or uh, musgraves if he if are we finally in a range where you would take a tight end i would have taken chase brown uh, i think he is i, I liked a band of candy before chase brown before the draft but I would take the Chase Brown situation over a band of Canada right now if I could pick. With Musgrave, you know what? This will be the spot I'd take Musgrave. He could be the tight end one. And I'm mm-hmm. getting him at the 309 versus someone took Dalton Kincaid at the 107. Yeah. Or someone took Michael Mayer at the 202. Like this was the perfect class. If you find yourself in the third and you really just don't want to pick a fifth or sixth round running back, take Musgrave. Take Schoonmaker. Yeah. You know, take Darnell Washington, Tucker Craft, like that. I, I think the third you could take a shot depending on your tight end room. I still don't love taking a ton of tight ends because they mm-hmm. just they can clog your team down when you have too many of them. Like you don't want to take three rookie tight ends on one team. But yeah, this would be a good place. I would have taken Musgrave for sure. Does scheme ever play into how you would, or or a team ever play into how you would draft somebody here? And on a second part of that question, if you have Brees Hall, are you prioritizing a Banacanda? So the first question, yes, there's obviously certain situations and historically certain places where you'll just take any running back. I mean, I am still rostering the Miles Gaskin and Salvin Ahmed on Miami just because they're still on Miami. But if you told me both of them left today and went to, you know, Washington and Houston, I'd probably just cut them in every league. So I think there's some bias there. Same with why you might be still rostering. Jordan Mason and Tyrion Davis Price because well they're on San Francisco Definitely and all it takes is Jordan Mason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the, until they're not there, same with like any Eagle running back the last couple of years, like you'll just hold on to them. So I do think that matters. And to the to the second part, I don't prior, prioritize handcuffs. The way that I'm playing, there's probably so much variance in my running back rooms that. You know, well, for every Brees Hall share I have, it, I probably have five Abana Candas. So, gotcha. It, 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 it's a it's a push or pull. I mean, if I have one Brees Hall share and I need to kind of like maneuver a piece around, you can probably get the handcuff. But I don't go out, you know, seek it just to make it happen. And if you're playing hero or zero RB, you mostly just have handcuffs at that point. I guess mm-hmm. so you're probably not 
not having too too high quality of, an, of a running back. One last thing before we get out of this third round, just for people who uh, might not know what it is, you you guys have been talking about the, the warp the warp warrior. Can you explain warp uh, really quickly for the listeners who might not know what that is? Man, this would be the longest third round pick of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Give me the 30 seconds to not, yeah. we'll boil it down, distill it if you can. 30, second in a, 30 seconds in a nutshell on warp. It's wins over replacement player. How you calculate replacement player is done differently at different sites. Essentially, you're trying to take a baseline for what would give you essentially zero wins. So wherever you want to put that threshold, some people measure it at like, you have to start two running backs. So I'm putting it at RB 25. Some people put it in the middle of what the starting spots would be. It's just establishing that threshold and then measuring. It's not so much the players. It's like the archetypes of players, like what type of player fits in there? Where do you want to prioritize maybe having a better player within your roster construction? So roster construction and warp go hand in hand. That's one thing I'm trying to bring to the podcast waves. Cause I think a lot of people just go right over their head. Gotcha. Good. Good summation there. All right. We'll see you at 4-9. Perfect. All right. We're back with Mason. Got the 3-10. What were the thoughts leading up to this? And who's the pick? Thoughts leading up to this. Please give me Izzy. Please give me Chase (laughs) Brown. Give me someone that has a shot to maybe start some games with an injury in front of them. And that doesn't happen. So instead, I sit here and I panic and... I convinced myself, okay, well, this is a tight end premium league. Okay, well, maybe I can throw him on a taxi squad for two years and then Pat Frymuth goes somewhere else. Maybe the talent profile was decent. I take Darnell Washington. It's a horrendous pick. We shouldn't have drafted him. I liked him going into the NFL draft, but at the end of the day, I mean, obviously this is someone that's not really going to score fantasy points year one. He's not going to score fantasy points year two. If this league has like a 10 player rookie slash second year option taxi squad. I'm fine with this selection. Mm -hmm. If this would be like a shallower league where maybe instead there's a smaller taxi where it's only two to three players on it and you can only throw your rookie, then instead you should probably just go through and take someone where you're going to feel fine cutting them after year one, like Eric Gray, if that makes sense. Because if it's a shallow league, Darnell Washington is going to be nothing more than a roster clogger that you have to cut a year from now. If it's a deeper format, then maybe you can look to hold on to him. So I do think it's very format dependent on what you should be doing here late third. Yeah. Is, so was what what would be the play here for you? If you're at 310 in the draft, are you trying to move up to 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 go ahead and guarantee yourself? Is he Chase Brown? Who, did you say Zach Evans? I don't know who else you said in there. To be honest with you, I think that the third, fourth round in this year's draft, the expected hit rates on these players are so damn low that I would much prefer just using these as throw-ins, as little trade sweeteners to get any other deal that I'm wanting done, right? Like if I want to pivot off of Deontay Johnson and go get someone in a similar range, maybe just Brandon Ayuk, just pulling a random name out of the air. Mm-hmm. And the guy goes, man, give me the your second round pick. I'll go, Hey man, I'll give you my third and fourth. Hey, can, can we just get this deal done? You know, that, yeah. that's how I'd rather use these picks. If I'm going to be honest with you. So you, you'd trade out of the, like if you could get two thirds to trade out of the third round, you would no no problem. Or is that like two 23 thirds or like a 23 and a 24 third to get out of the third, basically, would that be something that you would be fine with taking? Yeah. So if I'm on the clock and I can't find any other deals that I like, I'd be completely fine trading this 310 and get a 2024 third and fourth round pick because then during the season, maybe I'm able to go through and use those as trade sweeteners. Right. Same, same way that you wherever just, I'm looking. right. Same way you just were saying with the other ones. So yeah, no. Uh, what, so if you had to remake the pick, what would you said, Eric Gray, let's, let's assume it's a bigger, deeper bench, deep, deeper taxi squad. You're sticking with Washington or, or would you, why no? It, why no? Scoodmaker there. I I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit biased. I don't necessarily think that he is that talented of a player. At least I didn't going into the NFL draft. Obviously, the situation is dramatically better, so he's probably the correct selection. In reality, I don't necessarily think it matters too much. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the first two people we had on were like, man, Washington. I haven't even been looking at him. Glorified blocker on basically like a six lineman. Um, so, um, interesting, interesting pick there. And I I have to say that I haven't really been looking at him, but the, you, you just, the athletic profile is, is just, that makes you click the box. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, essentially him just being that great athlete. And like <laughs> yeah. I said, this being a tight end premium format, sure. if he is going, I mean, if we were going to be playing in that league where we have six to 10 taxi squad spots, I'm fine grabbing him here. In reality, I'm trying to trade out. All right. Well, we'll see you on the last one. All right, we're getting into the the doldrums of the draft here. We're at three eleven. We're back with uh, with Jax Falcone here of of the Undrappables. Um, what were you thinking here? Three eleven is it is it getting to where you're you're feeling pretty gross, or are you you liking what you got here? Man, I was I was kind of getting excited. Um, sometimes late in that third, I mean, think about it. Izzy Abanacanda went uh, two picks in front of me. Uh, Zach Evans went three picks in front of me. Kayshawn Boutte right before that. Luke Musgrave, one of my other favorites, right before. So I was hoping that one of those guys was going to fall to me. None of them did. Puts me in a spot where I can take one of these tight ends, Luke Schoenmacher. Um, Tucker Kraft might have been an okay pick. Yeah. I also really like now that there's some uh, smoke about Dalvin not being in Minnesota. I love Dwayne McBride. He's a bit of a two-down player, but um, you know he's he certainly could have opportunity. I mean – it's just possible that he's just a better straight up like runner of the football than Alexander Madison and could work his way onto the field as soon as very, very soon. But I went with Evan Hull. Uh, Evan Hull obviously goes to Indianapolis. He's, you know, a, a great pass down back. They no longer have Naheem Hines. Um, I guess it's probably not a very good spot in terms of targets out of the backfield with Anthony Richardson being the quarterback. But look, he's a JT injury away from, and we should all knock on wood when we say shit like that about JT. But um, but you know, he's a he's a JT injury away from potentially having a bigger role. I think you'll see some some action behind him. I think he could work his way to the number two and be sort of part of a you know a committee, if you will. Obviously, with JT seeing ninety nine percent and Evan Hall seeing one percent, <laughs> is that a committee still? Yeah. But you know, but Evan Hall more of that pass down back that they're that they're seeking from Naheem Hines in the past. So Evan Hall caught a lot of balls and mm -hmm. was very proficient. He was also very good at the Senior Bowl. He was one of the hardest working guys out there. He's fast. He's he's big enough. Uh, he's got a good BMI. I really like Evan Hall for a lot of yeah he's a good athlete so for a lot of reasons he could be um, you know a sneaky even a flex play potentially uh, behind JT if he if he locks down that RB two role yeah I mean we we got a new we got a new staff a whole new regime in there the Eagles you know Steichen never really committed to one guy necessarily True. now I mean it's JT so right I, I think Ursay might buzz down and be like you gotta you gotta give it to JT what are we doing yeah um, I'm sending Jeff Saturday in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you is this a spot where you if you have JT, you're you're trying to lock up a handcuff? Do you care about is it, are you getting a zone where you're getting in, in handcuff area or or you do you not really care? In Dynasty, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think handcuffing in Dynasty is a smart move because there's no waiver wire. So you really do want, you know, your own handcuffs in a lot of situations uh in Dynasty. Even handcuffing, dude, I handcuff tight ends and I handcuff quarterbacks in, in, in Dynasty because, you know, the, the worst thing is like when when you lose a quarterback and you go to look where he's at and he's on your, you know, your competitor's roster, you're like, dude, this is fucked. I'm screwed. There's no way he's, yeah. he's going to extort me at the at the at the best. The right. best case scenario is he's going to just kill me. Uh, the worst case, he's going to go tell me to go F myself. Like, right, that's right. the other one that he could do. Yeah, I just got a um, starter, bro. Chill. I'm keeping him. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So a lot of times it can really hurt. And same thing with running backs. I mean, ultimately, you, you know, you you have that that upside where, you know, if, if he does get hurt, you don't really lose a step potentially. So, yeah, I'm definitely doing that. It was a little bit of a gross spot. But I will say late in drafts, I'm generally not taking any of these wide receivers. I know some of them will hit here and there. But by and large, they're all garbage uh, all the late third and fourth round wide receivers. For me, the backstop is Kayshawn Boutte and Tank Dell. After those guys, I'm basically hands off. I, I like Puka Nakua. I love A.T. Perry. I, I, I've got little love affairs with these players, but I'm drafting none of them. Um, and I'm taking running backs. I take Dwayne McBride. I take Eric Gray. I take Evan Hull. Even running backs I don't like as much. I take uh, Chris Rodriguez. I'll take any of these running backs just because – they're an injury away from opportunity. As we always say in, 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 in fantasy football, you know, if a wide receiver gets on the field, he still might not be targeted. If a running back gets on the field, 
Uh, all they have to do is call a run play, and that motherfucker's getting the ball. Yeah. Yeah, this has been a very uh, common theme uh, throughout this third and fourth round. Very. There's very... one thing I took away from everyone. It's that you cannot be drafting wide receivers mm-hmm. late. Mm-mm. Yeah, uh, so. and I love them, too. We fall in love, but every every year that love affair just gets absolutely cracked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are still some some good shots there, but I, I I like the I like the whole pick there. I mean, you're was that somebody you were high on pre-draft or yeah, actually, yeah, okay, yeah. I would have liked to have seen him go to a different spot. I mean, mm. you know, somewhere where the the pass catching upside would have been a little bit more, maybe even a path to you know more touches as well. But eh, it is what it is. I mean, situations change. I, I don't love him as much, but he, yeah, he could have gotten steamed up to you know, early third round. If, uh, if he landed in the right spot for me, yeah, I liked Evan Hall quite a bit. Um, I, you know, he was still outside my top 10 or 12 running backs pre-draft, but still I liked him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't just, I liked a lot of these running backs to be honest with you. Like there wasn't a ton that I was like, uh, you know, and and, you know, it always feels good when, you know, the guys who, you you know, I had the McBrides and the Tuckers a little lower, um, and, and they, uh, ended up going a little lower. Uh, but you know, that's been plenty of years where that's been completely off. So, uh, uh, Anyway, um, give us give us the plug on the way out of here. <laughs> Same spot, baby. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dino Game Theory. You can find me on uh, Twitter or on the website of theundroppables.com or at the Undroppables. And of course, catch my awesome podcast. It's called The Undrafted. Find <laughs> it. Listen to it. Yeah, you should. A good guest list on there. So uh, dropping some fire lately. Um, all right, man. Well, we'll catch you on the next pick, which is the pick before Mr. Irrelevant. So you got it. See you there. All right. We're back here with Casey. Let's go. Let's give, go. Giving another layup. Yeah. Casey Mars, let's go. It's all case cam now, baby. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, again, this, this is, like I said, to start this thing, that these all kind of fell to me. We got, we got the Shoon, Shoon maker here. Um, which I still don't know how to pronounce his name. I want to do a recap Shoon, of this Shoon. show. You know, and, you could probably pull six different names. I uh, did learn how to say Puka Nakua's name. That's one of the mm-hmm. things I learned from this draft. But everybody said his schoonover's name different. Differently. I yeah. don't know what it is. So, again, he falls to me. He gets good capital. The the Cowboys and Dak. Dak likes soy. Love, loves a good tight end. Uh, he's he's pretty athletic. You know, there is Ferguson and uh, Hendershot there. Uh, you know, oh, I'm not yeah. saying he's going to yeah. necessarily walk into the role, but, you know, he really could be into a big role in a hurry. He's more athletic than those guys, um, you know, and, and it's it's really good capital, good path to uh, potential targets there. So, I, you know, I don't know how you take Washington over Shoon there for, for the flock, and I think he even kind of said that when we when we talked to that, about that pick there. So I think you got to flop those guys around, and I would even take Kraft over Washington uh, as well. So, you know, if you got a guy like Shoon falling to 312, you should be trading in and jumping on that immediately, especially 1.5 tight ends. I know, you know, we sat through all these guys and we'll talk about it in the recap show. So we don't need to get into it. But so a decent amount of haters, um, unless it's two point premium, which again, we can go over that later um, in the it's recap ba- show. Like basically, these dudes, 1.5 is not really a tight end premium. It's, right. If it's two, then okay. That's or, because or even, somebody, even somebody did a study somewhere that showed you that this one thing one time, and it's like, I can show you some some different numbers. No yes, one the guys cited get, any studies. You know, I didn't get any proof. That Jay's the guys that get out. fucking targets are going to score way more points if it's you're getting one and a half points per reception. And Shun could be one of those guys like a Dalton Schultz who just, just racks up fucking targets. So, um, and just sucks up and eats them, he eats in the middle of the field. Um, so, again, it, we've talked about it. Um, we've talked about it in other shows. I think we talked about it with Zoltan here to start it off with. You need a tight end to be able to trade in to get a tight end. It's much like the quarterback position. It's really hard to trade for an, a, more of an elite tight end without giving somebody the promise of another tight end and Shoemaker could be the step to get there or just be a really good pick here. So um, when we get into these tight end premium drafts of any sort, I am always going to favor tight ends. I would love Mayer. I would love Laporta. I would take him earlier i would take laporta earlier and i would take mayor potentially like i said when we were talking about levis a little earlier i would take Kraft earlier um shoemaker shouldn't have been here uh so you know I, i'm gonna stack up uh, opposite of what some of these guys said and and ray kind of hinted at it and some of those other guys hinted at it that a little later they're fine with doing it i'm fine with, with stacking tight ends at the bottom of your roster i'm fine with doing it the whole fucking draft like if, if you're gonna give me good spots on tight ends that i like and did the work on uh, then, then I have no problem drafting him, and this this was a fucking layup. So, all right, we'll hang around. We'll uh, we'll see you for four twelve. All right. <laughs>